Welcome to our services scheduled for August the 9th. Uh, I'm Charles McLaughlin. I'm pastor of First Baptist Church, uh, Lake Worth, Texas, and uh, we prepare this uh, type of message for those who cannot come and attend uh, our church service due to the uh, pandemic and perhaps for other reasons as well. And also we like to spread it around to our loved ones and families and uh, folks that we know to kind of encourage them along the way as well. So today we're going to be uh, looking at, at famine, uh, and famine sometimes comes. It, uh, it's interesting because we're looking at famine in the land of promise. Abraham was uh, given the promised land, go to the promised land only to arrive and have a famine hitting. And uh, so it, it reminds me a little bit of us. You know, we, we think of ourselves here in the U.S. as, as uh, privileged, and, and here we are in the midst of a pandemic, and it's uh, similar to having a famine, but not as literal as, uh, as some of the famines around the world. I want to make sure there's a distinct uh, difference. What we're experiencing is not exactly what other people experience in, in literal uh, famines around the world that are just devastating. So uh, we hope that you'll uh, enjoy the service, that uh, you'll uh, have a time of worship, uh, whether you're watching in the morning or in the afternoon. Uh, we're going to have a word of prayer together. If you would, let me lead you in prayer and you join me in prayer as I, as I pray aloud. Father, we thank you for today, the blessings you give to us. You're a wonderful, awesome, and mighty God. We thank you for how you have protected us, have been with us. You've answered so many of our prayer requests, uh, especially for those who uh, have had the COVID and others who have cancer and other, others with treatments and things like that. We just are so grateful for how you are taking care of us and helping us. Uh, you're a kind and merciful God. We continue to pray for our leaders and uh, for our country and for people around the world as all of us together uh, experience these difficulties and complications uh, that are now part of our uh, lives. Uh, so, Father, be with us now as we worship you. You are worthy of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today, Cynthia is going to play a special on the organ, and it's called Then Jesus Came. Uh, it's a pretty old hymn, and your mother used to... to Grandmother. Your grandmother used to have it. In fact, the, the book she's playing out of has grandma's notes and all that kind of stuff on it. And so it's, it's, uh, it's got a lot of good memories for her. And it's, it's great to have the faith passed on from one generation to another. I'm just going to read you the first verse just so you'll know kind of what goes along with the, the, uh, what you're hearing. One sat alone beside the highway begging. His eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory, for all is changed when Jesus comes to stay.
I watch TV specials and sometimes I think I know something until I watch TV and then see what life really is uh, in some place besides my world. One of those things happens to be where I was watching some of the most dangerous places to live. And one of the most dangerous places to live, uh, sometimes they have those that uh, experience severe famine and uh, have problems getting food all the time. And uh, you have people being uh, moved from one place to another trying to just see if they can help them get food to them or move them to a place where there is a source of food for them. And uh, when you look at the word famine, you start to realize how devastating a famine can really be because it, it, it just empties everything in terms of, of being able to have any food uh, to eat. Famine is mentioned in 17 books of the Bible and occurs 84 times in the Bible. So, and in fact, when you look at most of the Old Testament uh, characters and their stories, sometime in their lifetime, there is a famine in the land and they have to move around trying to figure out what to do because of the lack of resources that they're experiencing. Abraham, as you know, in chapter 12 of the book of Genesis is called by the Lord to do something very special, to have a special relationship with God. He was called to go into a land that God was going to promise to him and all of his heirs who came after him. So he obeyed God and left his homeland. The Lord had said to Abraham, leave your country, leave your people, leave your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. The promise, God said, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham decides to follow God and leaves every, everything that's known to him behind. He takes all of his belongings, his servants, and all that belongs to him, and he becomes a journeyman as he travels where God tells him to go. And as he goes, we see, and by, by the way, at the time he leaves, of all things, he's 75 years old. <laughs> I mean, you know, if I'm God, I'm thinking I'll call somebody who's young and who can make the journey without having problems. And no, I'm not God, he chooses one who's older and mature, all right? And so he's 75 when he takes off. He goes, and as he goes, he, he stops, and in different places, God will tell him, uh, I'm going to bless you by giving you this land. And uh, Abraham and God have a dialogue, and, and, he, and Abraham goes ahead and builds an altar unto God, where he builds something and leaves it there. And uh, one of those places is in Shechem, and another one is in Bethel. And so as he's journeying, he's built two altars along the way. Then we get to chapter 12, verse 10, and something interesting takes place. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. Now before I move any further, this is not just famine in any land. This is famine that comes in the promised land. Now, in other words, Abraham has followed God. God told me to get here. I finally arrived, and now there's a famine. Thanks a lot, God. That's really great. Thanks for calling me out here just to... You know, you're supposed to provide and all this. And now I get out here and I'm in the promised land where I ought to be having milk and honey and all that kind of stuff. And instead, there's a famine, and it's a severe famine at that. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarah was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abraham well for her sake, and Abraham acquired sheep, cattle, and male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But... The Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh 
and his household because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham. What have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abraham to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. So what we see is we see there is a severe famine, and a lot of times what happens is that when we have famines, we have very difficult times. And so I liken the famine somewhat to what we're experiencing through the pandemic. Because, you know, a few months ago, we didn't know anybody who had COVID, at least not in our church and not anybody around us even. And now we're all surrounded by people who have had COVID. In fact, not only here, but elsewhere. I've had others, uh, for example, in a job in Georgia where one of my contacts, uh, that, that we work for him in some jobs there, and, and he was just really scoffing at, at uh, the COVID and all that kind of stuff, and, and just it's a bunch of malarkey, until uh, his own family uh, caught COVID and had very severe difficulties, and then some of his co-workers, and then other, now he is surrounded by people. Even his mother ends up in the hospital for a week and scares him because she's barely able to make it out alive. And so with all of this, you, you, you start seeing things around us. Then you have the economy and the problems that we have, and, and, uh, and I'm a small businessman myself, and it's, it's, you're just barely holding on and hoping that it'll open up enough for you to have uh, enough work to uh, keep people employed and to make a living, because all of this is a, a severe, difficult time. Now, there's still food around, but it's just a lot of problems and anxiety related to how we are now living, and here we are in what we think is like the promised land because we really uh, we really feel privileged to even be in a free country and to have the resources that the United States has and of course we know the world realizes that thus you have the immigration problem of everybody wanting to come here because we are the land of opportunity so how does the great man of faith Abraham handle the famine and, and remember now he's, he's like the the founding father of the of the faithful and so what we see is he really doesn't handle it very well <laughs> uh, famine is a testing time it can test your faith it can test uh, your fear uh, for what's going on around you and it's a test also of your character and we'll see that Abraham really doesn't do well on the testing time that the famine brings Abraham's choices for example to go to Egypt do you think that is the will of God? Do you think he was following what God told him to do? Did, did, do you see anything in the scripture that indicates that God said, I want you to go here? You don't see that. Let me tell you, when he goes to Shechem, God tells him and sends him, you go to Shechem. This is where I want you to go. And, and there's a communication. There's something happening. He does the same thing at Bethel. But when you look at Egypt, I'm going to give you some reasons of why I don't think this was what, I think this is all on Abraham. I don't think this is on God, what God had planned for him. So the first thing we learn from Abraham when we go is how not to respond uh, to the famine in such a way as he did. Number one, rely on yourself instead of God. If you do that, you're responding negatively to the famine. You're failing the test. Rely on yourself instead of God. The text does not have God telling him to go to Egypt, and God tells him to go other places, but not here. And so the first thing we see is that Abraham rationalizes to himself, but does not communicate with or listen to God about what am I supposed to do. So he picks the rational decision he thinks in his mind, and that's go to Egypt where there is uh, there are resources there, and we won't starve there, and we won't have to worry about our, our animals but dying there and all that dying here. So he immediately just goes on, but you don't see anything that God is telling him what to do. So Abraham relies on Egypt instead of God. He felt that he had no other choice. This is the singular one choice I can make, and yet I believe it's a mistake. 
And it's always a mistake when we think there's only one choice to make. God gives us many different choices. Sometimes we just can't see them very well. Number two, he stops the dialogue with God. If you want to really fail the test in a famine, just stop dialoguing, stop having a conversation, and just start talking to yourself. Or if you want, just talk to the TV. Or if you want, talk to the politicians. Or if you want, just talk to other people. But don't talk to God if you want to fail the test. Because let me tell you, we do that even now. We talk to everybody else but God about how we are to respond in the midst of these difficult times. We sometimes want to act before we dialogue. And once we act, we then go to God and say, bless our decision. And God is saying, you want me to bless you going in the wrong direction. And because you made the decision without listening to me or even talking to me about the decision you have made. You know, one of the things you look at when I, when I look at Egypt, I realize there are no altars built in Egypt. You know, you go to Shechem, there's, an, there's one. Bethel, there's one. In fact, there's going to be an altar after that as well. We're going to see another altar later on that he builds because he's in that. But in Egypt, he builds no altar. And that's an indication that he has stopped the dialogue with God, that he's no longer asking and talking. In fact, uh, let's look at it for just a moment. If you look at chapter 13, that's after, after Egypt. Let's see what it says. Chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier. This is the previous altar, and where he had first built an altar. There Abraham called on the name of the Lord. He makes a decision where Abraham says to Lot, you need to go your way, I need to go mine, and he, let, he lets Lot make his decision. After that decision is made, Abraham went to live near the great trees of Mar at Hebron, where he pitched his tents. There he built an altar to the Lord. So you see, he builds two altars before Egypt, and he builds an altar after Egypt, but there is no altar in Egypt, indicating that really his dialogue with God just was not taking place at that point in time. Number three. Fail the test of character during the famine. Like I mentioned a while ago, there's always going to be tests that the famine brings, and one of those is going to be testing your character. Remember, you're going to be tested in your faith. Do you believe me? Do you believe I will take care of you? Do you really trust me or not? Or what about the test of fear? Are you going to live in fear and always let fear uh, control you, or will you let your faith in me help you rise above your fear all right and three the test of your character how are you going to respond and in this case what we see from abraham is he says to himself my wife who by the way is 65 years of age at that time and i always get a kick out of that because i'm going my gosh she must have been the best looking 65 year old woman ever <laughs> you know i'm just going wow she is so good looking that, that he, is, he is afraid, and sure enough, he's right. Pharaoh likes her. She's that attractive. I'll take her. Now, he says take her as his wife, but a lot of the scholars believe actually what he did is he took her and put her in his harem. And he maybe was going to marry her later, but at this point, he takes her and put her, puts her in his harem. And that provides another problem that we'll talk about in just a minute. But what you have here is what Abraham decides to do is to lie and thus deceive others about their relationship. I don't want to tell them the truth. And when you do that, you know you are failing the test of character that famine will bring because God does not desire for us to be liars and cheats and dishonest and people who you do not count on their word. God wants our word to be absolutely true. In fact, the deceiving and lying hurt his own reputation with the Egyptians. Number four, he fails the test by putting others at risk to protect himself. So if you want to just protect yourself, and that's it, and willing to put others at risk, 
Well, you're going to fail the test. You see, when he's not being faithful to Sarah's uh, relationship as a wife and saying she is my sister, the first thing he's doing is putting Sarah at risk. Think about it. Now she's got to she's got to go in and pretend she's got to lie because he's told her to orchestrate that. In addition to that, Pharaoh likes her, puts her in his harem. Now what are you going to do, Sarah? What are you going to do when he comes calling for a date night? What's going to happen? He actually risked the possibility that Sarah could get pregnant by the Pharaoh because of his weakness and lack of honesty and then lack of actually trusting in God enough to have faith to overcome his fear. Now, not only does he put her at risk and put the promise that God made to him at risk, he also puts Pharaoh and his family at risk because God brings about uh, things that happen to them uh, in terms of sickness and illness and problems and things like that, that Pharaoh even realizes what's going on and what happens. And somehow Pharaoh comes to the conclusion, this is the reason we're having all of these difficulties. And so you look at Abraham and you're going, you're well willing to put other people at risk and realize God loves everyone, including the aliens, not just those who follow him. He loves everyone and to put them at risk is also not what God desires or wants. That's not his preference, all right? And so with that, we need to realize that the way we respond sometimes is selfishly in the famine. I want it for me and I'll hoard it for myself instead of the willingness to share it for others. Reminds me of what happened to the toilet paper when all this stuff started. Man, everybody bought toilet paper. You can find toilet paper. And why? Well, I want it all for me. I don't that's the very same thing I'm talking about. The willingness to put others at risk for your selfishness because you're too afraid and you, have, you don't have enough faith that God's going to take care of you. Now with this, we, we then need to come to the place where we begin to ask, well, when famine enters the promised land, what are we really to do? Well, with that, I want to turn to Genesis chapter 26 where there is another famine in the land. Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. That's what the Bible says. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, now are you ready for this? Do not go to Egypt. <laughs> All right, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. For you and for to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commandments, my decrees, and my instructions. And thus you can see God also forgives and forgets. By the way, just one humorous rabbit to chase. Right after this, you know what Isaac does? Isaac's married to Rebecca. He does the same thing Abraham did. <laughs> exactly. My wife is so beautiful, I better not. And the, and it, the story repeats itself uh, for Isaac as he follows uh, Abraham's pattern, which is not the pattern to take uh, to follow. So we're going to follow Isaac's first part of the pattern before he trips up and makes a mistake. And when we realize uh, what, what he did at the beginning, he was doing it right. First of all, trust God to provide in the famine. Isaac stays put, follows God's plan to stay where he is, and when he does that, uh, God provides for him. And God makes him prosperous as he follows what God is telling him to do. Number one, trust God to provide for you in the family. All right? Number two, keep the dialogue with God. Don't ever stop having the dialogue where you're talking and trying to figure out what God wants you to do. What are you going to do, God, is one of the questions we ask. How are you going to meet our needs? How are you going to provide? What are you, what are you going to do? Secondly, we also ask, well, what do you want me to do? Now, 
I want you to know I struggle with this. This is a real, real struggle. Uh, you know, I, when I look at my business and I look at ups and downs and things like that, I look at the church and, and there's ups and downs. It's hard to reach people when you're not meeting or when people are afraid to come, uh, things like that. And so you start asking God, what, what, are, we, what are we to do? And, and when famine comes, you're asking some real questions. What, what, what way, what's God going to do? And what do I need to do? Should I not do anything? and wait on God? Or should I just do everything and make a decision and then ask God to bless it? You know, it, it really is a struggle. There, that's why you need the dialogue. Now, most of you have heard this story. Uh, in fact, I've had other people in the church tell it to me, but I want to use it because it really illustrates what I'm trying to say. A fellow was stuck on the rooftop in a flood, and he was praying to God for help. And soon, a man in a rowboat came by, and the fellow shouted to the man on the roof, Jump in! I can save you! Well, the stranded fellow on top of the roof shouted back, No, 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 it's okay. I'm praying to God, and he's going to save me. So the rowboat went on. Then a motorboat came by, and the fellow in the motorboat turned the motor down and shouted out to him, Jump in! I can save you! To this, the stranded man said, no thanks. No, it's all right. I'm, I'm praying to God, and he's going to save me. I have faith. So the motorboat went on. Well, the rains kept going, and of course it kept getting higher and higher each, uh, each time. Finally, there was hardly any room left on the roof at all. Then a helicopter came by, and the pilot shouted down, Grab this rope, and I will lift you to safety. To this, the stranded man again yelled, No, no thanks. I'm praying to God, and he's going to save me. I have faith. So the helicopter reluctantly flew away. Soon the water rose above the rooftop, and the man could no longer tread water until he drowned. He went to heaven. He finally got his chance to discuss this whole situation with God, at which point, God said, uh, in which he said, I'm sorry, I had faith in you, but you didn't save me. You let me drown. I don't understand why. And God said, I sent you a rowboat and a motorboat and a helicopter. What more do you expect? <laughs> well, really, you know, while that's humorous, it does describe us to a degree, and it at least describes the dilemma of what the dialogue with God is about. God, is, is this your answer for me to, to rescue me? Or do I need to do something else? What do I need to do and what are you going to do? So do I wait or do I act? And is my act, are my actions going to be faithful to you or not? Well, with that, I want to give you just a little bit of personal reflection on that. Number one, I think the most important thing to do is to dialogue with God. When we're going through these difficult times, we need to be people of prayer, and we need to be talking and, and trying to describe to God what we're, what we're wanting to do. We, we really need that dialogue. All right. Secondly, we then act in faith, based on the best that we can, that this is the best choice, and saying, God, I've asked you for choices. I've asked to, to look. Uh, I didn't want to just be focused in on I don't have any other choice but this or is there any other way? Uh, God, is there anything that I need to let you do and is there anything you need me to do? All right. So we act in faith. You see, part of my dilemma is when I'm talking to God is I want to wait on God to solve something, but then I also know God gave me a brain. And with that brain, God says, I expect you to do certain things as you think things through. And you talk to me about it, and maybe between your brain and my spirit, we can come up with a solution and a direction for you to go. So you act in faith to the best of your understanding of what God is asking you to do. And number three, don't be hard on yourself if the action that you chose does not actually solve the problem. Now what I'm saying there is talk to God, act in faith, and that's about the best you can do. All right? Even, you remember, uh, oh, good night. The, uh, one of the, 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 the main leaders of the, of the 
back in the day when I was raising kids, and uh, I've forgotten his name. It's just kind of gotten off my, my mind there. But anyway, what, what he said was that if parents are talking about what to do about their children's problems, if they're just dialoguing about the problems of what to do, he said you're already 90% past everybody else because most parents see the problems and don't ever talk about it and don't ever talk to each other about how to resolve it. He said, regardless of whatever your decision is, you're making a better decision just because you have dialogued about it. I kind of like that myself, and I kind of see that in this as well. Sometimes we don't know what to do, what the best thing to do is. We try to pray, think, dialogue, talk to each other, and talk to God, but we do the best we can. But with this, we act in faith expressing to God, this is the way I'm going that I think you're asking, and I'm just wanting to be faithful to you. That in and of itself means the most. Number three, take joy in the test that the famine brings. We find that a lot of times in the New Testament where Paul is always talking to us about take joy when persecution or difficulties come. And famine brings a real test, and we need to be joyful in the midst of that test. God has given us the opportunity to show him what we're made of. Here's a test of faith. How are you going to do? Here's a test of fear. Which one's going to win? Fear or faith? Fear leading to you need to be smart and need to know what to do and need to take, for example, protocol cautions and things of that nature. God gave us brains. We need to, to protect ourselves, but also to protect others because we don't know what we've got at the time. So we, we've got that going on at the same time. We don't want to be totally dominated by that so that we have so much anxiety that we can't enjoy or see life when it's happening to us right then and there. We also see the test of character that comes and we have to choose who we're going to be and choose to be people who are not selfish but people who have integrity, people who care for others. Uh, James Arthur Ray said, the test of character is not persistence when you expect a light at the end of the tunnel. The true test is performance and persistence when you see no light coming. I think he's got a lot to say there. So when I look at that and take joy in the test that, that it brings and realizing that famine is a test, one of the things I do is I look to Jesus and I realize Jesus shows me how to pass the test. When he goes to the cross and he dies for our sins, he goes willingly knowing what is happening. And he gives his life and allows himself to be tortured for us. He also goes to that cross and as he goes and as he's on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. He is mindful of others. He is not a selfish man. And he realizes and even asks forgiveness for those who are doing the very horrible deeds even unto him. Then he says to another, today you shall be with me in paradise. You know, I think about Jesus and I look at who he is and who I want and aspire to be. I've got a long ways to go, but at least I know which way is the right direction. Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 17 and 18. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, Though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet will I exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. I'm going to close with this word of uh, one little word of, of story because sometimes we need to understand how God works in mysterious ways when there is famine in the land of promise. Back in the 30s, during the Depression days, my family, my dad would tell stories of his family going through those difficult times. One of them was the story I told you in a previous sermon about Mother Mac and, and picking cotton in order to save the church where my uh, grandfather was the pastor. Well, this is another story about them. What happens is, and, the, and they actually wrote about it in the book about my dad called Dr. Charlie. I've got plenty of these books in case you want to do some light reading. It's a lot of good stories in here. And so this is what happens. I just want to 
to, to read what my dad said, okay, uh, uh, during these times. During that time, my grandfather was paid just $50 a month and he, to pastor, and he would pastor different churches. And one of the churches uh, said, if, if we can't pay you for, for three months, you need to quit because we don't want to be in debt to you up to $150. Well, in three months they were in debt, he had to quit. <laughs> uh, my dad wore hand-me-down clothes. The hand-me-down clothes actually came uh, from, from other kids in the area. And dad would literally go to school, and one of the kids would say, hey, those are my shorts. And dad would say, no, they're not. And the kid would then point to a little mark on it and say, see, those are mine. And my dad would have to, to kind of, you know, well, I've got hand-me-down clothes from everybody else, but that's, that's just the way it was. People couldn't tithe, and so they, they gave stuff to the pastor to try to, to at least help, you know, that kind of thing. And so with this, one of the things they had back in that day that my dad's family had was a cow. And the cow was very, very important because it helped not only provide for them, but also they could sell some of the products that the cow produced. We were dependent on a cow for our living in the, in, in the main in those days. That cow meant everything to us. We milked the cow in Coke County and drank the milk in Nolan County because the county line ran between the house and the barn. Uh, that cow got sick. And Dad had me help minister to her. We tried everything we could to save that cow. But one day he said, son, go get the cow. We have to, we've we got to dispose of her. We just can't get her to do well. We didn't have a pasture. We just turned the cow loose back in those days. So I started looking for the cow walking across town. Finally thought she might be over by the school. I was cutting across the railroad track looking. As I came down the railroad trestle, I looked there on the track, and there was the dead body of our cow. The train had run over her and killed her. So I came back to my father and said, you don't have to worry about the cow. She is already dead. The train ran over her. Well, that's, you'd think that's the end of the story, but that's not the end of the story. The train people looked Daddy up. In other words, those who ran and owned the train or were their representatives, they were embarrassed to have run over the cow. They wanted to make it good, so they, uh, they gave Dad a brand new cow that wasn't sick. My mother, my mother Mac, sat me down on the bed in the bedroom and opened the Bible to Matthew 6.33. She read to me, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. She explained to me that this was not an accident. The train coming at that time and our cow coming at that time was God's way of providing for us. I have remembered that from the day when I was just a small boy until this day. I have recognized the teachings of my mother in practical day-by-day -day living by faith in God and the meaning of Scripture. Though I have been to the seminary and have been in many theological discussions through the years, my theology has never changed from the theology that I got from my mother's knee. Well, I hope you'll remember, in the famine in the promised land, the final word is the story of the cow. They depended on that cow, and God provided another one. You never know what God is going to do. Sometimes it's a wise decision, and sometimes it's God coming out of nowhere to meet your need. But until then, let's all try to pass the test when there's famine in the land of promise. Would you join me for prayer? Father, we thank you for who you are. Father, we know we are being tested. It's not a matter now of when. It's a matter of we all are going through times of testing because it is like we have famine in our promised land. So, Father, we pray that you'll help us. We want to be faithful. We want to be true. We do not want to be deceivers. We want to be ones who trust in you, and we want to be ones who act in character and even generous in caring for others. Father, we pray you'll help us to be the kind of people we need to be during these difficult times. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
This song has a very special, special meaning to me. It's a, it's an old gospel song that I've been singing my whole life. But uh, one, one Sunday morning, uh, I was going through some things in my life, and I literally woke up from my sleep singing this song, physically singing this song. It woke me up. And I got my guitar and I got up and I went in the living room and I started playing it and singing it. And uh, the song became a new meaning to me. And uh, it's one of my favorite songs. It is well with my soul. Sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou's taught me to say, it is well, it is well. should come my way. Let this blessed assurance control. Whatever my lot thou's taught me to say, yes, it is well, it is well. Glorious, glorious thought. My sins not in heart, but the whole. They're nailed to the cross, and I bear them no more. Oh, praise the Lord. my 
and taking the time to do that and, and uh, we just want you to continue to stay safe. A few little announcements that we uh, have to make and that is uh, now next week I won't be here because I'll be uh, traveling with Anna and so we'll be, be doing that. I've never made that, that kind of journey before so that'll be uh, interesting and we hope for the best on that and uh, then we hope Anna well as she goes and she and I are just fine. It's just right now with the economic situation she wants to go up there so she can uh, help uh, make a living and that kind of stuff and so I'll, I'll be going up there from time to time uh, due to uh, job potentially that I, I think we'll be getting a few up there that'll send me up there from time to time it shouldn't affect my preaching and, and being here just to kind of do, do things during the week but uh, anyway that, that's kind of what's happening uh, reminder Christ uh, Fellowship Bible Church will start on the 16th and uh, they will be meeting after us and they'll just be using it that one day uh, we're going to be, we have some COVID protocol things that we're going to be uh, setting into motion to protect us, and uh, they'll be doing some things to protect themselves as well. And so we've, we've uh, had a lot of good dialogue about that, but we think it's good, uh, a good stewardship of the building and, and, and the facility. You realize that they really couldn't meet in, in schools right now because everything's so up in the air with COVID, it's just really difficult. And so this is a real blessing. Uh, to them, and, uh, and and we're looking forward to, to being able to share and doing some maybe ministries together and things like that. So anyway, that's that's kind of what's going on, and uh, you'll have a, a guest preacher here on Sunday. We may have a, a video that's different. We're we're just figuring that out for next week. All right, but thank you for joining us, and God bless you. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot. We will be having the garage sale. And I need to tell you for this week. Uh, what day is it? Thirteenth, fourteenth, and fifteenth that they will be having the garage sale so uh, you're welcome to come by even before then and and take a look and we have a lot of good stuff i mean there's some really interesting stuff back there so uh, you want to if you want anything or if you know others that want something this is a good time to uh, to come take a look don't forget about the garage sale all right thanks <laughs> <laughs>